Legend of the Highland Giants I've lived in the small town of Bolden, at the base of the Scottish Highlands, for the past 67 years. When I was young, my parents told me that I was born in an even smaller town farther north, but I have no recollection of it. To be honest, I've never considered living anywhere else in the world other than Bolden. I can't imagine anywhere more beautiful. One main road winds along the coast, with buildings on either side made from grey stone. We fishing boats dot the waterfront, and most days musicians are playing the bagpipes and the accordion while people eat at restaurants serving fresh lobster and haggis. My house is about 25 minutes outside of town, mostly secluded by one of the last forests before the rolling hills of the highlands. It's a wee house, just the way I like it, and the only people who ever drive by are tourists. The living room always smells like wood smoke from the fireplace and almost every piece of furniture in my home has a memory behind it. My grandfather built the oak rocking chair by the fire when he was a young man. My grandmother bought the couch with a floral pattern on a trip to Edinburgh shortly after the war and the dining room table was a gift from my sister when she moved back to Scotland after living abroad for most of her adult life. I've been in this house for the past 60 years but not a day passes when I don't see something that makes me think about my childhood. I was in this house when I lost my first tooth. I was here when I had my first boyfriend when I was 16. And I was here when I had my first breakup when I was 17. The other night, there was a bad rainstorm. I had decided to wait it out and make myself a cup of chamomile tea. I was sitting in the rocking chair next to the fireplace with the tea between my hands, thinking of my younger years. The rainstorm outside was worsening. It was one of those nights when even the birds and mice shouldn't have been outside. Rain tapped against the metal shingles of the house and against the tarp in my front driveway that covered a pile of firewood. Something knocked against the house from outside. I stopped rocking in my chair and listened. I wondered if something was blowing outside. The knocking echoed again this time more clearly from the front door. I got out of my chair and walked toward the sound. I hadn't had a guest in a month and nobody in their right mind would have been out on a night like this. I opened the door enough to see two figures standing outside. They were both wearing yellow rain jackets the colour of grapefruit peel, with the hoods pulled over their heads and faces. The man had a dark beard hanging below his jacket, and the woman had long brown hair matted together from the rain. The woman pulled her hood down far enough that I could see the dark features of her face. 
our car broke down. I rushed them both in and shut the door behind them before she had time to finish speaking. What are you doing out on a night like this? I asked. Let's get you out of those jackets. Our car broke down about half a mile away, said the woman, and we can't get phone reception. I took their coats and shook out the water. Their sweaters looked almost completely soaked through, so I went to the guest room and found them some dry clothes to throw on. After they had changed, I took their wet clothes and hung them on a rack next to the fire to dry out. Neither the man nor the woman could have been older than 25, and they both had English accents. Didn't your mothers ever tell you that you'll catch a cold if you're running around in wet clothing? I asked, as I set the kettle to boil more water. I was just telling myself that not even the birds or mice should be out. The man explained that they had hit a pothole about an hour ago. The car had started leaking oil, but by the time they'd realised it, the engine was already on the verge of seizing. They were on their way to Bolden from their trip in the Highlands. Well, you almost made it, I said. Another 25 minutes and you might have rolled up to the driveway of your guest house. I placed a new log on the fire and wiped my hands on a rag hanging next to the fireplace. I offered to call a tow truck for them. It might be a while though. There's only one truck in town and on a night like this, I don't know how keen they'll be to make it out. They thanked me and I poured them both a cup of tea before calling the only garage in town. Once I hung up, I told them that it would be at least an hour before the truck arrived, but that they were welcome to wait as long as it took. Thank you for your hospitality, said the woman. You have a very beautiful home, she added. I love that painting. She pointed to a painting of Bolden painted from one of the nearby mountains. Thank you, I said, explaining that I had painted that a very long time ago. The woman unfolded a blanket onto her lap and the man put an arm around her shoulder. They told me that they were both from London and were on their first trip to Scotland. I've lived here my entire life, I said. Wouldn't want to live anywhere else. It's beautiful here, said the woman. I'm just glad we stumbled across your home. If we kept driving, we might have had to walk for hours. I smiled at them. You would be fine. The giants of the Highlands would help you find your way to where you need to go. The what? asked the man, before looking at the woman. You mean you've never heard about the giants? I asked, as the fire let out a loud crackle. They both shook their heads and I laughed. I leaned back in the rocking chair and intertwined my hands on my lap. They had to hear the legend of the giants. Then let me tell you a story that my parents told me and their parents told them. A long time ago, deep in the Scottish Highlands, there was a community cut off from the outside world. It bordered the North Sea and was tucked away in a cove hidden by an archipelago of islands. Anybody who sailed by would only see the rocky islands and the mountains behind. The only people who knew the town existed were the people who lived there. 
the community was special because not only was it home to humans, but also to the giants of the highlands. Nobody knew where the giants came from because they had been there for as long as anybody could remember. The giants weren't sure where they came from either, even though they lived much longer than humans, as much as 300 years. None of them could remember living anywhere besides the town. The giants looked the same as humans, except they had disproportionately long arms and legs. The tallest of the giants stood close to 12 feet high and weighed well over 1,000 pounds. Even the giant children were taller than most full-sized human men by the time they turned five. Despite their large size, the giants were genial creatures and never came into conflict with the humans. The giants and humans lived peacefully with each other. The giants did jobs like bringing lumber into the village and the humans built the houses and caught enough fish for the entire community. However, the peaceful days wouldn't last. One day, there was an accident. One of the giants, named Goron, came into town with so much wood in his arms that he could barely see past all the branches. He stepped on a man who wasn't paying attention and the giant broke one of the man's legs. A rumour began to circulate around the town that one of the giants attacked the man. Goron denied the attack, but the rumour seemed to take on a life of its own. The humans held a town hall meeting in secret to discuss what to do about the giant. The giants had always helped the humans with their community, but they could still potentially be dangerous if they ever decided to attack. What if next time a giant stepped on somebody, it was a child? The mayor of the town decided to let the giants stay, but some of the townspeople decided to take the problem into their own hands. They made torches and gathered their pitchforks and told the giants that if they didn't leave, they would burn their homes and attack their children. The giants left the town in the middle of the night. They didn't understand what had happened, but they understood that they weren't wanted anymore. They wandered across the highlands for six days before settling down in a valley surrounded by mountains. The giants decided that if the humans wanted to be left alone, they would never speak to them again. They would live their lives in the mountains, living off the land and learning how to fish. However, the giants quickly realised that life without humans wasn't so easy. They had trouble threading their fishing lines and they didn't have the dexterity to build their homes properly. The woman asked, The giants left, but they sounded so nice and they didn't do anything to the humans. Would you like another tea? I asked. They both nodded and I went to the kitchen to refill their cups. I brought them more tea and called the garage again to see if the tow truck had left yet. The man on the other side of the phone told me that it was going to be another 20 minutes at least. When I returned to the living room, the man was sitting on the couch and the woman was looking at a picture of the highlands I painted many years ago. They're going to be another 20 minutes or more, I said. Do you want to hear the rest of the story? Of course, said the woman. She sat back down on the couch next to the man and he put an arm around her. So I continued. The giants built up their community over the next hundred years 
until it was even larger than the town they lived in with the humans. In the human town, three generations of people grew and passed. Nobody was left alive who remembered when the giants lived with them. The giants were remembered only by stories, and eventually, those stories became myths. One September, so much rain fell that all the giants agreed that it was the rainiest month that they had ever seen. It rained almost every day until many of the hillsides became covered in mud. When it wasn't raining, a fog so thick that you couldn't see your own feet covered the hills. Goron was walking through the forest one day and got stuck in a rainstorm. The wind howled through the trees and he could barely see a foot in front of his face as the rain poured through the branches. He heard a tiny voice scream, Help me! from somewhere nearby. The voice sounded like it was coming from a human child, but the giant couldn't find the source of the voice until the boy cried again. Goron looked down where there was a pit from where the forest floor had collapsed more than eight feet into the ground. A tiny boy was stuck in the pit and was covered in so much mud that only his eyes were untouched. Goron reached an almost two metre long arm toward the boy and hoisted him up. The child who was sniffling began to scream when he saw the giant. Goron calmed the boy by telling him stories about when the giants and humans lived together. By the time they reached his community, the boy had stopped crying. It was raining so hard that there was no way Goron could bring the child back to the human town until the weather improved. The boy lived with the giants for more than a week until the sky opened up and the sun began to dry the hillsides. The giants debated what to do with the boy. Some of them wanted to let him find his own way home since they promised never to contact the humans again. Goron told the other giants that he would carry him back to his home, but none of the other giants would come with him because they believed the humans would attack as soon as they saw them. There were rumours that the humans had more advanced weapons than they did the last time the giants had seen them. That's so sad, said the woman. Someone knocked on the front door and I pulled the blanket off my lap and stood up. I haven't had a visitor in months and here's my second of the night. As the door swung open, I saw a familiar face. It was Jack from the garage. We had gone to school together a very long time ago. I pointed to the couple sitting on the couch and told him about what had happened. All right, it looks like you're free to go, I said to them, and asked Jack to bring them back into town. Can you tell us the rest of the story first? Asked the woman. It would be a shame if we didn't find out how it ends. Please. Jack laughed and asked me which story I was telling. When I filled him in, he kicked off his shoes. He sat in a chair next to the couch and stretched his soft feet toward the fireplace. So I resumed my position in the rocking chair and pulled a blanket over my lap. Goron kept his word and took the boy back to the human's town. It took more than a week for him to find it again, but along the way, the boy and the giant became very good friends. 
When they reached the outskirts of the town, Goron and the boy came across a group of three fishermen working on their boats on the shore of the North Sea. The fishermen stared at the giant in awe. They dropped their tools and ran toward the town. When the giant arrived at the place he used to live, he found that the town had changed a lot in the past hundred years. The edge of the town was now guarded with a stone wall, built up higher than Goron's head. Men stood on the wall with bows and arrows cocked toward him and told him to let the boy go. Goron put the child on the ground, but the boy didn't run toward the town as Goron expected. Instead, he began to cry and told Goron that he didn't want to go home. He wanted to live with the giants forever. The boy hugged Goron's leg and wouldn't let go until the giant knelt and hugged the boy back. The men lowered their weapons in confusion and opened the doors to the town. A woman ran out in tears, snatched the boy from the giant and ran back into the town with him. Goron gave the men a final wave before turning his back to the men and returning to his community. A week later, a group of a dozen men arrived at the giant's home. They were weaponless and shook in fear as they walked into town. The men told the giants that their ancestors had made a mistake and that they wanted the giants to return to their town. They would offer the giants all the free fish they wanted and they would help the giants fix their homes if they returned. The giants told the humans that perhaps the humans were right and that they shouldn't live together. They wouldn't return, but they would watch over the humans and help them if the humans ever became lost in the mountains. In exchange, the men told the giants that they would return once a year, every year, with enough fish to feed the giants community for a month. I'm glad to hear that the story has a happy ending, said the woman. Do people still return to see the giants? That's how the legend goes, I said. We have a festival every September to celebrate the giants who look after us. I'm sure that no matter where you broke down, the giants would help you find your way back to safety. They're like our guardian angels. The woman and man smiled and stood. They changed back into their clothes and I led them and Jack to the porch. As they slipped on their shoes, I wished them luck for the rest of their trip. They thanked me for the tea and my hospitality. Jack thanked me for the story before pulling his hood over his head and guiding the young couple back into the rainy night. I put another log on the fire, sat in the rocking chair and folded a blanket onto my lap. The fire crackled in the fireplace and the rain continued to tap against the metal shingles. I smiled to myself and thought about the giants with my eyes closed as I rocked myself to sleep. <laughs>